A CTV program in color. Tonight on W5, an ex-con's eye view of the Kingston prison riot, the chances of war in the uneasy peace of Thailand, and a tragic portrait of Saint-Jean-Vianney, Quebec. Good evening, I'm Jack McGaw. When a man goes to prison, he loses his right of free speech. But sometimes we ought to listen to what he has to say. More than 500 men rioted at Kingston Penitentiary three weeks ago. Apparently they were trying to say something about our prisons, and they didn't really succeed. And since our Solicitor General, Jean-Pierre Goyer, may not publish the report of the Board of Inquiry investigation into that riot, the prisoners may never get their message across. Here's Ed McGibbon, who has been reporting on penal problems as much as any newsman in Canada. Nobody really knows what happened inside those walls three weeks ago. Even the 500-odd inmates who took part in the riot don't know the whole story. And if Solicitor General Goyer succeeds in keeping the lid on the incident, we may never know. Suppose 500 men demonstrated for four days, held hostages, bashed each other's brains out with steel bars anywhere else in Canada except inside one of our prisons. Wouldn't we as Canadians be jumping up and down demanding to know what was wrong? Over the last century, there have been countless Canadian prison riots with murder and bloodshed, sit-ins, demonstrations of all kinds. Kingston Penitentiary alone has experienced at least five major disturbances that I can recall since the 1930s. But they've always been considered the wild behavior of a bunch of undesirables who belong to another species. We've never felt any responsibility or much concern for what convicts have done or what's been done to them. So, if we accomplish anything with this television report, perhaps it will be that we as Canadians on the outside can learn something about ourselves by reliving the April 14th riot with Canadians who were on the inside. John Larkin is the first convict released from Kingston Penitentiary since the riot. On April 27th, he completed his latest sentence for possession of narcotics. John first became addicted to narcotics under medical treatment in a German prisoner of war camp in 1943 at the age of 17. After the war, John kicked that first habit and became a pro welterweight fighter. But in the early 1950s, he returned to narcotics and of the last 20 years has spent 12 of them in prison mostly in Kingston. During the four days of the riot, only inmates really saw what happened. And John is the first inmate who is free to tell the whole grisly story. The day after his release, he called me at my home in Toronto and said that for the first time in his life, he felt a real need to talk publicly. Somehow the, the riot and its aftermath he felt had changed his whole life. I took him to a hotel, checked him in, and for the next three days we talked and I checked the validity of his story. Early this week we consulted Jack McAdam, design artist, and Dave McFadden, staging manager at CFTO-TV, CTV's affiliate in Toronto. We asked them to construct a simple model of Kingston Penitentiary. The idea was to illustrate graphically how the 550-odd inmates were organized during the four days they had control of the institution. All right. 
approximately four and a half feet. Four and a half. Yeah. So I'm really working what a four by eight. Uh, four and a half by eight. The cell. That's, that's the, cell the cell. Was mentioned. Wow. Isn't that? We decided to limit the model to the cell ranges and circular central dome area only because that's the area John could talk about firsthand. John, when the riot broke out, where were you? I was uh, in 1A range in the fifth cell. This, this is your cell and this is where you'd be yeah, for the 18 the months that you've been in here? Fifth one down is mine. All right, now, you were in bed, it's about what? 10.30 at night? Maybe 10.30, maybe 25 to 11, no more. What was the first thing you heard? Well, I heard a slight commotion and I heard the keys fall, uh, the lock, the main lock keys, the cell blocks. And heard a few curse words and you get up, you Specifically, son of, what did you hear? Well, Tell me exactly. You get up, you son of a bitch, and I'll kill you. And uh, I, I thought it was some con getting beat up. And the next thing I know, there's somebody, I heard somebody running around in here, around the whole opening there, and 1H. And I get up and look, and I seen some shadows going by there. Well, was, that, was that here in the dome area? Yes, it started in the dome area. Well, they have to come through the dome to get it down here or in around the hole there. Oh, I see, yeah. And I heard guys, uh, guys sell uh, more keys falling and a bit of running. And uh, then I heard people being asked if they want to get out of their cell. When the cells were opened, how did you feel? Well, I felt stunned myself. I, I didn't know what was happening, or I had no uh, idea what was happening, and uh, was a little, a little afraid too. What were you afraid of? <laughs> well, I was afraid it w was what it turned out to be—a riot. Why were you Thursday, Thursday night, Friday, and Friday night that things were pretty well organized I in terms of this being a a riot, a demonstration riot, right? right? How did you how did you feel about things at that point? Well, I was uh, like I say, I was kind of proud to be a part of it. Uh, we were going to try to get some demands, and uh, I loved violence. I even forgot that I had the short time, and I, that's how confident I felt until uh, I guess. Friday night, it start. Uh, you'd see the strain starting to show. Well, Saturday at noon, the, the committee were starting to fight amongst themselves, and they were trying to calling each other liars and <laughs> what. I don't. There's doubt there now. There's a, there's confusion and doubt. It's pretty hard to keep three or four or five hundred guys. Uh, you all have different versions of what's said. All, uh, well, I was getting scared myself. No settlement. There's no uh, agreement on anything. And things really started to shake then. Guys are uh, well, afraid of one another then. And groups. There's groups starting to form up. and Different groups. So I started staying closer to home from then on, and uh, closer to home being your cell. Yeah. At that point, what what did they tell you? Well, the the the, the ultimatum or whatever you want to call it, the, the this is a the time to put up or shut up. It's a, and each member of the citizens committee was on tape, and uh, they told us exactly what it would be and how uh, things would happen. Nobody would get beat. From what I can understand from that tape was that we should be out of there, or they want us out of there, by 12 Monday noon. Did you take the vote, and what was the no, result? No, we never ever got around to taking the vote. Uh, that's the thing. That's when she blew. Con against con now. Three or four dozen at the top range said, well, anybody that wants to fight like men, come to the top. The rest of you is 
stay down the stairs. Some, something to that effect. Next thing I knew, I seen them dragging out chairs around the dome, and uh, everybody was taken out of their cells, told to come out of their cells to witness uh, the trial of the whatever you want to call it. I don't know what you'd call it. Something I never seen before in my life before. And they tied guys to chairs, uh, so-called finks and sex deviates. And well, they were given the business. What sort of things happened? Well, they were smashing guys over the head with pipes and... Uh, well, I was, uh, I was ashamed to be a part of it, I'll like, tell you that. I, uh, fellow prisoners would be the uh, stool pigeons or sex deviates or still humans or still prisoners, the same as us, and they're... Somebody acting as God, taking them out there and beating them over the head with pipes and pillowcases over the head, well, that's too much for me. I, that's, I want to back out of that act. John... I want you to tell the camera and the public what you saw that night. Because if you don't tell them, I don't think anybody is ever going to tell them. Well, I told you. I, I told you. I seen name. them bring them in chairs, and uh, I couldn't even tell you the people who were involved that uh, tied them around there and put pillowcases over the head. They tied their feet and hands to a chair and. I've even seen them put a tumbler on their head and smash it into their head. And, uh, even seen a guy take a quaff of another inmate's blood. For, uh, yeah, it's disgusting. It's even uh, it's, it's too dreamlike to believe it myself. It's, uh, I can say I've been lived a pretty rough life, but that. Uh, Soften me up a bit. What is it I mean? didn't think that I could uh, have been telling Jack there. I never seen a man change before right in front of my eyes. A guy that I've maybe known quite a while. He just turned right, that was a complete cycle in a matter of minutes. Oh, one one day, a normal person, as normal as you can get a person in there, and uh, next day, uh, don't even recognize his features or his eyes. You have a, a weak character person power over another man. He, he sure knows how to misuse it or he sure can't stand the pressure. I've heard from other cons, one other who was in there, that two old men were badly beaten and tortured, one of them for hours. Do you have any knowledge of this? Yes, I do. What knowledge do you have in that area? Well, i just seen them battered around. Do you think that those two men are alive today? <laughs> well, uh, they must be, but it seems impossible to me. Why? Well, I don't... Uh, I know one of the old fellows had a bad heart, and I, I don't know how he end up under a beating like that. I don't think I could. What form did the beating take? Well, uh, same as the other guys, pipes. And I thought there was an act of mutilation went on there, too, but uh, they say no, so that couldn't happen either. But I, well, I thought I'd seen a, an act of... Uh, Well, uh, he was, he had his pants down. They were trying to get, uh, get out of his private parts, I suppose. I don't know. I got disgusted. And what did they do to him? Well, I, I'm, I can't say no more than that. Were knives used? There were knives used. How were they used? Well, cut, cutting guys' legs and. Why did the guys smash the bell and the desk first in when that riot broke up? 
Well, that was a that was a thing of hate the, that just reminded them of all the bells. Now, like for instance, at eight o'clock they have the silent bell. That's thirty years ago. The silence. That prison can be completely silent, which it usually is at eight o'clock. But that bell goes. I've often jumped in my bed like that. Bell giving a smash. What what does the silent bell mean? Well, that means you don't talk no more. What causes riots, John? Well, uh, the abuse. Uh, man can only stand so much pushing around. Uh, you know, the guard don't feel good. He can say what he likes to you. you get over there as if you were, I don't know, as if you were. Nothing. I've been in uh, there five, six times now, and uh, nothing's changed. Dr. Peter Kelly is the psychiatric consultant at the Collins Bay Medium Security Penitentiary near Kingston. He's the only psychiatrist available to 400 inmates, and it's on a part-time basis. I drove to his country home to talk to him about an article he has written based on his experiences at Collins Bay and earlier as a psychiatric consultant at Kingston Penitentiary. Dr. Kelly was reluctant to talk to us because of the federal government's policy of secrecy over the Kingston riot. But since he is on the staff at another institution, he felt it could help spark a public debate to bring about reform. The recent episode locally, I think, was a very good example of what's going to happen if you deny the fundamental rights of a human being. Um, Professionally, the, the basic drives of a human being are for loving and for assertion of the self. And these are, these are basic biological drives, and, and they're denied in a prison system. They're regimented, they are treated all the same, they, um, there's no loving relationship. They're, um, so therefore, you know, very commonly, it's, it's physical expression, homosexuality is quite common. Are we out to extract a pound of flesh with this system, or are we out to rehabilitate the man? And don't forget that a man going into prison, the majority of them anyway, are um, somewhat deprived emotionally, culturally, socially, uh, very often have deep-seated, poor self-esteem, depression, and are resentful of authority and you put them in a system which aggravates all three, you get a man and you regulate him entirely from the second he goes in to the second he goes to bed. You lock him away. You don't give him any privacy. You've got a, ro a range of, of rabbit hutches with, with bars on the front that somebody can come in and look at at any time of day or night. Um, they're not allowed to uh, turn down a tray in the, in the dining hall if they don't like it. Or you've got to take it anyway. Um, they can't even get, give vent under these stressful circumstances to, to their emotions. They, they're liable to a charge. You can't really rebel. Many do, especially youngsters, and always get in trouble. But a lot of people just switch off. Um, it's known the sensory deprivation, the early fog these people just block right into. Um, and some of them uh, can crack many, many, many periodically under under uh, terms of detention. Just start to go, they call it, sh to get the shakes or the nerves go, or very commonly they come along and say, lock me up, I'm going to hurt somebody, or lock me up, I'm going to hurt me. It seems to me that the main thrust of what you're saying is that there's a battle shaping up between the custodial people and the behavioral science people. Is it a battle? Well, very, very nicely, but very definitely, yes. Um, what is, well, what's the shape of that battle? Well, we're losing badly. Uh, the the emphasis of the, of the penal system is still primarily for state. There's no doubt about it, and I think the whole of the governmental and solicitor general and the hierarchy, their whole approach is still fundamentally security, political consciousness rather than the knowledge we have of human behavior and what we should do with these people. Why? Well, 
well as a simple behavioral scientist, I'm not sure. But um, uh, it's a long tradition. I think the, the real reason is that they feel, probably, and it's safer to feel it politically, that if you are keeping people tied up, then you're protecting the citizen, and the average citizen is willing to buy that. Canada imprisons per capita 12 times as many people as Great Britain. Why? Is it a kind of an oppression that's peculiar to Canada and Canadians? Is it the kind of thing that the inmates at Kingston Penitentiary were complaining about but somehow couldn't articulate? Maybe they did blow it. Well, the federal government could blow it too unless the findings of the riot investigation are made public. Ken LaFoley examines the many conflicts within Thailand after these messages. <laughs> 